Hi, I'm Matt Weaver, and I'm here to tell you an amazing story. A story of exploration, adventure, but even more important, the story of the Exodus. So I had the opportunity to travel with New York Times bestselling author Joel Richardson and also noted Fox News contributor Ryan Morrow to the land of Saudi Arabia to see the evidence for the real Mount Sinai. The story of the Exodus is really the story of the children of Israel. Israel is a nation that God has chosen from, from the beginning of recorded history back in the days of Abraham. Abraham lived uh, thousands of years ago in the land of Chaldea, which is modern day Iraq. And Abraham is asked of God to leave his country, to leave his family, and to travel into the land that he will show him. This land ends up being Canaan. But Abraham is a very uh, storied character. There's a lot of things that happen in his lifetime. Uh, one of the greatest uh, of these stories is the story of how uh, God brought about Isaac, the promised son, into reality by faith through the life of Abraham. Isaac has a son named Jacob. This Jacob's name is changed to Israel and Israel becomes a nation. Uh, they're taken down to Egypt, the story of Joseph. Joseph, how he delivers the known world from the starvation of the famine that is in that day. Later, this people is subjected to slavery, and they're enslaved by the Egyptians who are masters and lords over them. The children of Israel had come into the land of Goshen, according to the Bible, and they had settled in the best of the land because of the faithfulness of Joseph. But the Bible records that there was a Pharaoh, a, a ruler, who arose who did not know Joseph or the deeds of Joseph. And he saw the people and it was concerned that these people would have too much power. God miraculously saves one son. His name is Moses. No one else besides Jesus himself has had as much impact on civilization as Moses. Moses is an interesting character in the Bible. He is saved from the destruction of Pharaoh by his mother being wise and, and hiding him in the reeds. He is found by Pharaoh's daughter and Pharaoh's daughter raises Moses in the ways of the kings and the princes of Egypt. Moses takes matters into his own hands as he witnesses an Egyptian striking an Israelite. And in this, Moses is distraught and he goes and he kills the Egyptian to save the Israelite. Moses flees into the land of Midian. Exodus 2 verses 11. Now it happened in those days after Moses had grown up that he went out to his brothers and saw their burdens. He noticed an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So he looked around and when he saw that there was nobody, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Then he went out the following day and saw two Hebrew men fighting. So he had, so he said to the guilty one, why are you beating your companion? The man answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Are you saying you're going to kill me just as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, For sure the deed had become known. And when Pharaoh heard about this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. Where he sat down by a well... Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came and drew water. They filled the troughs with water, their father's flock. But shepherds came and drove them away, so Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, 
How come you've returned so soon? So they told him, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. He drew water from us and watered the flock. Where is he then? He said to his daughters, Why did you leave the man behind? Invite him to have some food to eat. Moses was content to stay on with the man. Later he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom, saying, I have been an outsider in a foreign land. Behind me is the well of what the locals call Shweib, which is the, with, which is Jethro, sheikh of Midian, according to the Bible. And uh, different accounts basically you know, write about what happened here, but we know that you have um, Moses, as he left Egypt, came to this region, Obviously, quite a journey away, but this is the ancient region of Midian. As we went through uh, this region, we, we stopped at, um, in al -Bah, there's ancient caves that date back to the Midianite period. And we explored these caves and we've seen evidence for this truly being Midian. The region and the city was known as Madya or Madian in ancient times and in ancient maps, solidifying that Midian has always been on this eastern side of the Gulf of Aqaba. Midian never was in the Sinai Peninsula. Midian has always been over in this region. Any academic will tell you that Midian is in northwest Saudi Arabia on the eastern side of the Gulf of Aqaba. This is key in understanding the story of Moses and the mountain because Midian is the central, most important uh, evidence for Sinai being in Arabia and not in the Sinai Peninsula. Midian had never been on that side. There's no history, there's no local record of it ever being on the western side of the Gulf of Aqaba and the Sinai Peninsula. We saw many evidence for Midianites living there. We also went to the town of Magna, and in Magna there's two important things. There's a local tradition that Moses lived there, and we saw a spring that is located in the outskirts of Magna that dates back to the time of Moses, and it's said that Moses himself lived there for a short time before he went back to deliver Israel. And it makes sense. It's not far from Al-Bad, and it's also a great place to, to escape the heat of the desert, as the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aqaba is close by. So in this story, God calls Moses after 40 years of living in this wilderness, living in this land with Jethro. He has a house. He has a family. God calls him out to, to sends him back to be the leader of Exodus. Several key pieces of evidence exist in the land of Arabia to cement the location of the mountain. First of all, we read in the Bible a story of the bitter waters made sweet. And there's local traditions uh, called different places Mara. So the, Mar the name Mara exists there, even on maps. The other one is also this word Elim or Elam, which is where there was 12 wells and 70 palm trees. This still exists in the land. We were at the entrance of, of the wadi that leads to Elim, and this wadi is called Wadi Taib. Uh, we didn't have enough time to get back to the wells and the, the palm trees, but they exist nevertheless. In chapter 16, we can read this. They journeyed from Elam, and the entire community of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. So in the region between the two is where they traveled. On the 15th day of the second month after leaving the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Israel said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat, and we ate bread until we were full. But you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this entire congregation with hunger. Then said the Lord to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The people will go out and gather by day a day's portion every day. We're going to skip forward. We can understand that this is the first place, after Elam is the first place that the miracle of manna began, and it was that way for, for many years, almost 40 years.
all the congregation of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin in stages, according to the command of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. So the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? The people thirsted for water there, and they complained against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us with thirst along with our children and cattle? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What am I to do for these people? They are about ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Walk before the people, and take of the elders of Israel with you, along with your staff, which you struck the waters. Take it into your hand and go. Behold, I will stand before you. Notice it says here that God will stand before him. There upon the rock in Horeb. I'm going to stop here for a moment. If you're in the middle of a wilderness that is nothing but rocks and sand, how are you going to know where the rock of Horeb is? It has to be something unique, something that stands out, something that you can see from a distance and you would have known, uh, know what he's talking about. Well, in this valley, close to the mountain of God, you find such a rock. It is a rock that stands out in the middle of this great valley, and it is a massive rock. It is something that you would have, would see, that you would know about. I've been to Israel, I've been to other places, and there's uh, there's different names for, for special rocks that stand out like this, and it's something that people uh, awe over. If you're in Timna Park in Israel, you'll, you'll see mushroom rock, uh, and it's something that is not that big of a rock, but it's unique, and so people take note of it. Well, I think this is such a rock. And this is what it says, You are to strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people can drink. Then Moses did just so in the eyes of the elders of Israel. The name of the place was called Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of Israel, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So I'm standing here at the split rock at Horeb. And uh, according to the Bible, the children of Israel came up through from the wells of Elim into this valley coming up uh, from the direction behind the camera here into this precinct. And, and it says in the Bible that God said to Moses to come into the rock of Horeb. And when you come into this valley, this rock sticks out like a sore thumb. And it's massive. It's huge. Uh, a lot bigger than what a photo can take, uh, you know, do justice to. But... It is incredible to, to see this firsthand. Uh, I've seen a lot of photos, a lot of evidence, but when you're here in person, you see the erosion, you see things that you just don't see um, in detail in a photo or video. And it just look, it's just, to me, undeniable that this is the correct location for that. So when we look at the whole story of this rock, this split rock, it's where God stood before Israel, where water came out, where they could drink of it. But not only that, but he delivered them from a great conflict that took place in this valley. It's the Battle of the Amalekites. Now in 18, chapter 18, we read about Jethro being priest of Midian. He's obviously close by. He's about 15, 16 miles away in modern day Albad. He hears about everything that it was done, and he decides to travel out uh, to meet Moses and the people. In chapter 18, that takes place. In chapter 19, 
of the Exodus, we read about Theophany at Sinai. And it says this, In the third month after Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, the same day they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. They traveled from Rephidim, came into the wilderness of Sinai, and set camp in the wilderness. Israel camped there right in front of the mountain. So this is describing the journey from Rephidim around to the wilderness of Sinai and camping in front of the mountain. And then it says, Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, Say this to the house of Jacob and tell Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings, how I brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As we entered into the region of Sinai, we were just awestruck at the magnitude of the place. The mountains are really high. The desolation is absolute. There is very little around there. There's a couple Bedouins that live at the base of the mountain that have lived there for generations. But as a whole, it is left untouched. It is left unspoiled. We read in verse 4, So Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, rose up early in the morning, and built an altar below the mountain, along with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. He then sent out young men of Israel who sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. Now if you read this, you can understand uh, the significance of this, of this spot. One of the things that you should see at Mount Sinai is an altar, and we do just that. We find an altar, a high place with chutes for animals to go in. Not only that, but we also see where 12 cut stones uh, were once seen. We see nine of them today, but they're of different heights, and they look like columns. Uh, I've been to many places and seen columns uh, sections, and these are definitely column sections. So we have evidence for columns, and we see the evidence of the altar that is still there. Saudis have excavated it, and they found animal bones, and they found ash, exactly matching the biblical description of this mountain. It is at this place that, that Israel first made covenant with the Lord in sacrificing burnt offerings. And we read here, continuing in verse 6 of chapter 24, Then Moses took half the blood and put it in the basins, and the other half he poured out against the altar. He took the scroll of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. Again they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do and obey. Then Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has cut with you, in agreement with all these words. Then Moses and the priests and seven elders of Israel went up, they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet was something like a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the very heavens. Yet he did not raise his hand against the nobles of Israel, so they beheld God and ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay there, and I will give you tablets of stone with the Torah, which is the Ten Commandments, um, as well as the, com the other commandments, which I have written so that you may instruct them. So Moses rose up along with his attendant Joshua, and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. To the elders he said, Wait for us here until we come back to see you. Moses goes into the mountain of God, and he's lost up there after the covenant. Israel thinks that something has taken place. As Moses is receiving the instructions, we see all the the examples, the things of the, of the tabernacle, and how to, to live in covenant relationship with God. And we read all these things, and God goes through, step by step, everything that they are to make. But down below, the people are getting restless. They're thinking Moses has disappeared. Now, at this time, Israel was really a slave population. They had lived in, in Egypt for 400 years in slavery. And when Moses disappeared into the mountain to receive the commandments of God, they were concerned. They didn't know what happened. I'm standing here at the base of Jebel Makla uh, on the whole laws or lose range um, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, behind me you see the valley uh, with the altar in this direction. 
And also up the mountain you can see uh, where it's thought perhaps Elijah's cave is at. The children of Israel had been at Sinai for some days. After the cutting of the covenant at the altar, the Bible accounts a story when Moses went up into the mountains for 40 days and 40 nights, receiving the instruction of God. At the base of the mountain, there was this a disruption. They didn't realize that Moses would be gone so long, and they wondered why it was taking him so long. And in chapter 32, we read the account of the golden calf. And it says this, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Get up, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Break off the golden rings that are in your ears of your wives, sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He received them from a their hand and made a molten calf fashioned with a chiseling tool. Then they said, This is your God, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Then Aaron made a proclamation, saying, Tomorrow will be a feast to the Lord. They rose up early and the next morning, sacrificed burnt offerings and brought fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. If you would be a part of the greatest story in the Bible, the Exodus, you'd think that after you had seen the sea split, that you would see the army of Pharaoh destroyed, that you would be faithful to this God. This God who is in the pillar of fire uh, at night and also the cloud by day leading you. But we read in Exodus 32 how the children of Israel were still learning to be obedient to the Lord. After Moses was in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, Israel was thinking that Moses disappeared. And so they instructed and asked Aaron to build for themselves a god, somebody they could worship. Aaron follows the instruction of the people and he builds them a golden calf. And we read in the Bible that he builds this and there's this bull worship going on. In Egypt, there's Apis and Hathor bulls and the Israel would have known about the worship of Apis and Hathor. And so Aaron builds this, this god for them and they worship, they sacrifice to it, and they say, well, this is the God that has delivered us. And it's at that moment that God tells Moses to come down to his people and to, to because of the corruption that was going on, that they were committing truly idolatry. And so Moses comes down and he throws the tablets that God had given them and destroys them, and he deals with Israel at this mountain. If this is truly Mount Sinai, then it would make sense that we actually find a pile of stone with inscriptions of Apis and Hathor bulls, something that dates back literally thousands of years in a region where there is no cattle. There's no cows in the region of Sinai. It's too desolate and arid, but yet there we find inscriptions of cattle at the base of this mountain where there is also an altar of uncut stones just as the Bible describes and where the glory of the Lord came and where the covenant was made with the house of Israel. Standing here at the Golden Calf Altar site, and behind me you see the rocks where we found the, or where the petroglyphs have been found of Apis and Hathor bulls, and then you see the peak in the distance behind. Um, and again, another testament to the validity of the site and to the accuracy of the biblical account.
There's a story in the Bible we all love to hear, and it's the story of Elijah. Elijah is this prophet that lived in the days of old who who stood up to Ahab and Jezebel the northern, uh, in the northern tribes of Israel, northern ten tribes. Ahab was a king. And he stands up to this Baal worship, and on the Mount Carmel, he, he builds this altar, water around it, and fire comes down from heaven. And after Elijah kills the prophets of Baal, Jezebel puts out word that she is going to kill him. And Elijah runs. And it says that Elijah comes down into the regions of, of Sinai, into a cave. And in that moment, Elijah is running. He's not sure. A great miracle has just happened, yet Jezebel is after him. And he fears for his life. But we read in the story that God meets him there in the voice of silence. In the voice of silence, God is, says to Elijah, what are you doing here? You don't need to be here. Go back to your people. Finish your mission. In this region, one would expect to find a cave, and sure enough, in the middle of the precinct, right below where the covenant ceremony took place, um, looking up from that area, you see a cave, a prominent cave on the side of the mountain. This cave is considered to be the cave of Elijah, the cave that he went to where he heard the voice of silence and heard God speaking, and he went from there back and finished the mission that God had for him. The God of Israel is not finished with his people. He is going to continue the narrative that is in the Bible. He is going to fulfill what was spoken by Moses. He's going to fulfill what he spoke through the mouths of the prophets. And we read here in Psalms chapter 78, we're going to begin in verse 12. He did miracles in front of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the plain of Zoan. He split the sea and led them through. He made the water stand like a wall. But by day he led them with a cloud, and all night with a fire. He split apart rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink, as abundant as the depths. So he brought streams out of a rock, and he made waters flow down like rivers. Yet they added more, sinning against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They put God to the test in their heart, demanding food for their craving. Then they spoke to God, saying, Can God set a table in the wilderness? See, he struck the rock, waters gushed out, streams overflowed, but can he give bread? Will he provide meat for his people? In the story of Exodus is contained the plan of God for the world. He is going to bring out a nation for himself. He's going to save a people for himself to live with him forever. And in Jeremiah 23, he's building on uh, what had happened. He says this in verse seven, therefore behold days are coming, says the Lord, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but rather, as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and from the lands where he had banished them, so they will dwell in their own soil. There is coming a day, very shortly, when God is going to bring out the people that he has scattered, the people who were at Sinai, who he made covenant with. He's going to bring them back into the land. He's going to live with them as king on the throne of David in Jerusalem. We live in these last days. We live in the time when we see the realities of these prophecies coming to light. And let me ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you eagerly awaiting the appearing of the Lord, the Son of Man, who will come riding on the clouds of glory, who will come through from the mountains of the south, leading up into the city of Jerusalem to deliver Israel out of the hands of the oppressor? Are you willing to embrace the truth of the God of Israel? Are you ready for the coming of the glory of the Lord in the day when he returns to deliver his people forever? <laughs>